Welcome to the Firebelly Social Show. We're focused on talking to food and beverage brands that are on a mission to make the world better. Hey, 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 everyone. Duncan here with another episode of the Firebelly Social Show, where we chat with founders and leaders of mission driven food and beverage brands. And I mean, this is just a really, really unique group of people. They are so dedicated to their craft. They are committed to the work they put in the hours. And it's just a real privilege for me to shine our light. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We have a great show lined up for you today. We're talking with Bryn Jones, who is all things Hughes Culinary Group. He has scaled internal brands. He's an entrepreneur. He's an entrepreneur. I'm just really excited to have him today. This episode is brought to you by Firebelly Marketing. At Firebelly, we help mission-based food and beverage brands bring people closer together through social media marketing. So if you're ready to use social media to create more community and excitement around your food and beverage brand, go to firebellymarketing.com. And so with no further ado, I mean, listen, if you've ever been in the Midwest and, you know, potentially anywhere in this country, you've heard of St. Elmo Steakhouse. It is an iconic place. It's an iconic experience. And um, Bryn has done an amazing job spearheading the growth of the good side of it, uh, being an internal entrepreneur and taking the cocktail sauce to 3,000 locations, um, regionally and nationally. Uh, and he's launched the spirit side of the business with the uh, iconic vanilla cherry bourbon. And he's got some new products he's going to talk about today. So I'm so excited, Brent, to have you. Welcome to the show, my man. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, I'm happy uh, happy to be on. I love sharing our story. we got such a great group of individuals that, that we work with. And uh, the owners at our group are just such fantastic people that have, uh, you know, helped uh, put a lot of people in situations like myself where we can, you know, keep expanding the portfolio and and uh, yeah, and having having fun while we're doing it. Um, you know, we went to cocktail sauce and that was great and and scaled that up and and we'll talk about that I'm sure. And then we went to seasoning because refrigerated products uh, were the bane of my existence and and supply chain and all of that navigate. And then and then we went. You know what? It'd be it'd be a hell of a lot more fun if we were just selling alcohol. Can can we do that too? Because uh, then we can enjoy our our own products at home. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it's been a fun. It's been a fun process that and uh, and and help and lead the uh, the marketing efforts for uh, all of our restaurant brands, which is uh, one of the other hats I wear too. So, yeah. I know, right? I mean, in terms of, I was saying to you in the pre-show, in terms of guests uh, and their involvement with marketing and operations, you know, with on-premises uh, and um, you know, out in the wild. I mean, you really have one of the widest experiences um, and. So let, let's just talk a little bit. We'll start, you know, with uh, the piece that most people know, which is, uh, you know, the restaurants. Um, you know, what's what's that been like? You know, with um, not just St. Elmo's, but launching Harry and Izzy's and all the other locations, bringing it to the airports. Uh, what a journey! Yeah, it's been it's been fun. I mean, I've I've been. Uh... I think I was in the back seat for a, a long time and, and, you know, working, I used to work on a, in a separate business, entirely separate business from uh, today when I started with the group, gosh, that was probably 17 years ago. That's how long I've been with them. But uh, I was brought up just before the Super Bowl uh, when that was in Indianapolis to uh, just to kind of take over marketing efforts for St. Elmo Steakhouse and Harry and Izzy's. And that's really where I started. And, you know, cocktail sauce and some of these other things came from that. But um, my foundation was uh, really in just marketing and doing marketing. So I came up in a, in a traditional background, which is like, you know, buying TV and, and radio, uh, very traditional marketing, and then got to St. Elmo and went, wow, we don't buy any TV and radio and almost everything is PR uh, and, and social based. And I'll be honest, it, it, it's more work, but it's also, it's a hell of a lot more fun, um, you know, and, and I think it's been you know, I, I think on the marketing side, we try to look at it, you know, especially in social where we're not selling as much like we want to just tell stories and 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 develop and build brand connections and and uh, share the stories both internally and externally of people that have connected with our brand in some meaningful way. And that's a lot of times those are the best and, and, and highest performing uh, marketing activities we can do. And they're also, like I said, they're also the most fun. So, I mean, the brand extensions are so uh, impressive. And the PR has been so impressive. And of course, the shrimp cocktail, um, you know, is something that uh, 
people will say, even when you're traveling and a Hoosier abroad, people will say to you, oh my gosh, I've been to St. Elmo's, that cocktail sauce. And so you all took that experience. And I guess your directive was, um, from some of the founders of the brand, um, the, the overall brand, is like, go, go take this and see what you can do with it. Yeah, I mean, pretty much it was. So Craig is Craig and his father, Steve, have always been just super disciplined. And, and you know, that's where Harry and Izzy's came from is like we knew we could expand upon St. Elmo. But also, you know, how do you replicate uh, the server that's been there for 40 years and the stories and experience that they share and, and what they bring to the table? So Harry and Izzy's was a way to expand on, you know, the the legacy of, of St. Elmo and the success of St. Elmo, but not do it in a way that cheapens the brand. And I think we try to do that on the cocktail sauce, too. Um, normally in CPG, uh, you're a spice company that sells to spice buyers, and then you go work with all the spice buyers. Um, you know, in terms of our world, uh, we're as complex and and hard uh, to deal with on the, on the sale and buyer side as we could possibly be. You know, we have cocktail sauce, which sometimes goes into seafood. Sometimes it's in in the dairy department because it's got to be refrigerated. We have the seasoning buyer. Uh, we're in produce with um, our, our salad dressing and you know other products that, that fall into general grocery. We have to work with the spirits buyers. Um, sometimes two categories of spirits buyers. If it's RTD versus you know um, kind of mainline, so it, it it's a very complex thing. But I, it also speaks to uh, the. The discipline again from from Craig and Steve and and myself, I've, I've definitely followed their lead in that. Let's never do anything that cheapens the brand. I mean, we could put Saint Elmo's name on you know a, a line of bread or something, and and almost anything in the brand equity that's been built into Saint Elmo over the years, we would probably sell a lot of bread. But at, at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we don't do anything that cheapens the brand. So any product that we take to retail has a story. Uh, it's something that has been proven within our restaurants. Because uh, step number one in any in any spirit or, or food brand is you've got to have a really good product. Uh, step two is you've got to kind of tell somebody about it and get them to try it, preferably at the same time, wherever you can. And so uh, with the restaurants, it was a natural vehicle to get sampling, have people try these products. And then when you're doing the ideation and the R&D on them, you're not going to the cocktail on the list that's like the 17th best cocktail. You go, all right, what are our top two or three cocktails? And that's what you take to market. So we're this weird approach, or, or, or I think very beneficial, but weird approach where we're using sales data to drive our, you know, our, our expansion and, and drive our decisions of what products we take to market because they've already been proven. That's phenomenal. I love it. Data that leads to strategy. That's uh, you're you are a sophisticated marketer, my man. And um, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm guilty of being uh, a customer of the seasonings of the shrimp cocktail and the vanilla cherry bourbon and uh the uh yeah for the youtube watchers there it is um and it's the, on a side note the crazy thing is the conspiracy theories around the cocktail sauce you know do they are they injecting uh the essence of uh, of well, uh horseradish into each bottle you know i've heard all kinds of things i mean that is just amazing uh that it has a life of its own in terms of its heat and, you know, there's challenges yeah. that go on. It's just amazing. Yeah, it's I, I'll give you the I'll, I'll give you the, the real answer in, in the Cliff Notes version of it is. So we originally started with a local uh, company in Indianapolis. You know, we don't pack it in our kitchen. It's we're not set up for it to do it in St. Elmo. And there was no way to really scale that. I mean, fast forward to today. I mean, we're, we're selling, you know, we're distributing over a million bottles worth of product a year. You know, so to do it out of a restaurant that's already, you know, jam packed and, and running out of space obviously wasn't the move. So we, we partnered with a group to do it locally. Uh, we, we eventually outgrew them. And in the process of switching to a new co-packer, we, we worked with a group um, and they are the number one purveyor of horseradish in the U.S., purveyor and, and bottler. So both, both farms and processing. Um, so. And here's the R&D process with them. We probably went back and forth 25 times. And each time I was like, it's close, but it's not hot enough. And they're like, like the, the president at the time, he's like holding his nose. He's like, I can't, I can't even consume this stuff. It's too spicy. Are you sure it's supposed to be hotter? And um, so uh, probably four uh, ulcers from trying cocktail sauce every day. I mean, not really, but 
Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, just just trying that process over and over again, it's it really is. It kind of knocks your your eyeballs out for a second. Uh, but that's the way it's always been in the restaurant, and it's a it's a pretty simple process. I mean, they're they're small batching the cocktail sauce um, two to three times a day in the restaurant. And so that's a big part of how it always stays so spicy. And we replicating that in bottle form was really difficult. Um, but the innovations that our, our co-packer, uh, they've really helped streamline it and get it to a place today where it is, it's really close to the experience that you have in the restaurant, which is phenomenal. It, it's really cool. That is just the ultimate, uh, the product extension of a great experience. And I love the fact that you'll test your, um, your cocktails, uh, well, but develop them based on sales data. And then you have the perfect test environment, uh, with your own customers. Uh, talk about, the talk about, uh, before we get into the new exciting, uh, products, uh, let's talk about the, the solid, uh, vanilla cherry bourbon. Yeah. So, so when we, st- when we started that, um, yeah, I guess for anybody on the, on the, on the YouTube version, but so we started this, uh, uh, 2019, we started co-packing uh, with a group down in Bloomington called Cardinal Spirits. Uh, great group, great, great distillers, great people. Um, started co-packing with them and and got to a point really quickly where uh, our, our distributor, RNDC, before we started, said, hey, you know, we should all be really happy if we do a thousand or fifteen hundred cases in a year. Um, and, and I think I had a, you know, I didn't I I don't believe in challenging people on situations like that, but I think we were we were also at the t- same time pretty confident and, and optimistic that we were going to be able to beat that number because, you know, we have relationships with Costco, uh, Meyer, Kroger, you know, Target, um, Market District, all of these stores. A lot of the packaged liquor stores are good customers and, and friends of Craig and our team. So we knew all of the players and in a lot of cases had a proven track record of driving sales for them and creating products that people want. So. Uh, long story short, going into it, instead of 1,500 cases the first year, we did close to 15,000 cases, I think just just over 15,000. So um, it was super successful. And it got to a point where we're going, well, shoot, if you know we're co-packing with these guys, and um, sometimes it's you want to be able to solve your own problems um, and, 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 and do that, you know, kind of on your own terms and a little bit faster, move a little bit more nimble or so long. It, it was it was a it was a pretty long process to actually find a, a building that would work for it. Uh, but we purchased our own building and then uh, kind of took over the operations of, of that product. And and now we're trying to continue to scale and, and expand that, that product. But yeah, it started uh, the actual cocktail itself, I guess, going back to the start of it is uh, it's been on the menu at St. Elmo for over 10 years, probably 13, 14 years now. And it was when craft cocktails were starting to become a thing, you know, and bars and restaurants were, were talking about that. And so we, we we worked with a consultant and and then Carrie, our, our bar manager, is still with us today. He's been with St. Elmo for 39 years. So he started kind of working with this guy and, and just figured out this process where you're essentially infusing cherries into, you know, a really good bourbon, infuse the cherries into it, add some, you know, vanilla uh, at the time, vanilla paste. And it just has a richness to it and you know it's it's at a at a bit of a bit of coke and it's kind of an adult cherry coke so uh been tremendously successful and uh, a fun project to launch and and build and and now kind of continue building and and growing you know is a but was a little side story uh that's very near and dear to my heart that in, in, in includes the vanilla cherry bourbon um my uh, late father on his last visit to the United States which, uh, from India in late 2019, uh, early 2020. And uh, we went to um, Harry and Izzy's uh, for his 80th birthday. And they were asking him what he wanted. And he, 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 he made this funny gesture with his fingers. He was in the early stages, of, mid stages of dementia at the time. And he goes, yeah. I want the vanilla cherry because I was trying to sell him an old fashioned. Okay. Second. But I want them. And so that became a joke. You know, he remembered it. And even when he was like in the very late stages, I, I joke with him about the vanilla cherry. Um, so uh, let's talk about the stuff that you're excited about. You've got some new things going on. Yeah. So we've got uh, a few new projects. Uh, one, we just like within the last month and a half uh, launched a vodka brand called Barkeep Vodka, um, barkeepvodka.com if you want to kind of check it out. And the process, um, it, it started as essentially doing R, R&D for 
uh, the cocktails line uh, of St. Elmo, so St. Elmo cocktail. So we we did a, a two of the products on that side. We have an espresso martini and a cosmopolitan. Both of them were vodka based, and so in the process of that, we we connected with a guy. Uh, his name is Matt Rubin with True Essence Foods in Indianapolis, and uh, he's just an just a genius, scientific innovator uh, type of guy. And he created this process uh, for actually a separate industry. Uh, chocolate at the time and and then later coffee and figured out he could <clears throat> run um, any distilled or fermented product through his uh, the, this this process that he patented, which puts it kind of under just just a ton of pressure. And what that does is it breaks down and and removes the molecules that create bite, burn and aftertaste. And so um, we're we're sampling this vodka as part of this R&D process. And yeah, I think a lot of food and beverage companies, they go, let's hire a master distiller or, you know, a, a, a flavor expert, um, somebody with an amazing palate uh, to do their R&D. And we go, mm, yeah, we're going to send five uh, trained bartenders down there who are serving these drinks every day, know them better than anybody else. And, and they're going to hit that flavor that's already been proven. So, uh, again, great team in place to create these products. And in the process of that, they started trying the vodka and they're like, we like, why aren't we taking this vodka to market? Like, why don't we consider doing a vodka? And at the time, is it St. Elmo's vodka or something else? And, and so we, we felt we, we, we were excited about it because we knew we had a product that, I mean, you take the bite and, and uh, out of vodka and you turn it into this incredibly smooth uh, spirit. I mean, literally that is the smoothest, cleanest vodka um, anybody on our team has ever sampled. And so we're going, all right, let's take that. But in order to take it big, um, a restaurant in Broad Ripple or Carmel or, you know, even in Illinois isn't going to want to put St. Elmo bourbon or St. Elmo vodka on their on their menu. So in order to really scale and, and grow the brands, we had to differentiate them from the restaurant. And and that's what we've done with uh, with Barkeep is the first one. So started with an amazingly clear, clean uh, spirit and built a brand around it. So the, the packaging on, on this, and again, you'll see it online, but uh, anybody that's, that, that may be watching. So uh, you've got a, just a nice, cool kind of silver spoon in the background shines through the front label. Uh, we want it to mimic and, and look like a, and kind of represent the vodka. So it's, it's a very clean label, clean packaging. Uh, we knew on that product uh, commodity spirits, Every spirit is different from a marketing standpoint. So uh, with vodka, we knew we had to create something uh, where the packaging was extremely efficient because um, it, it, I wouldn't say it's a commoditized product. There's definitely differences in, in vodka, but it doesn't matter how amazing your vodka is. If it's $30 on the shelf, $40 on the shelf, it's probably going to have a hard time to get trial and, and adoption and build a brand on that. So um, basically, we wanted to, we knew we had an amazing product. We had to build a brand that could efficiently get on the shelf at a price point under every other high end vodka. So we had the best vodka possible, but we knew we had to come under uh, on price. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're purchasing a, uh, a Texas based vodka, um, off the shelf without naming names, like our, our goal is, is to be, you know, two to $3 less expensive, um, than theirs. Um, so that that's kind of been the goal is, you know, build a better product, create a better product, price it better um, than anybody else, and then make sure the label and, and the packaging look pretty badass. So and, and we're super excited about that. The sales results so far have been fantastic, um, already beating expectations. And that's usually hard to do and usually doesn't happen. <laughs> so uh, that's been a fun that's been a fun project. So that's uh, that's the, the, the that's barkeep. and. Barkey vodka in a nutshell. What uh, I mean, what I think. On that? Can I just say, you know, that the the uh, the more I hear about it, uh, and I'd read a little bit about it, but the more I hear about it, it is so uh, incredibly thought through. So it's um, the other piece is it's Indiana corn, yeah. and it's distilled how many times? So it's distilled uh, six times. It's made in a it's, uh, the distillation. We have a distillation partner uh, that we work with to kind of hit our spec. But it's it's essentially in terms of 
uh, high volume, super efficiently produced vodka. This is the highest spec of vodka anybody um, anybody's creating, at least to our knowledge. And so we start with a very, very pure uh, vodka made in a zero loss facility. It's gluten free, allergen free, impurities free. Um, it, it starts already with a really good vodka that you could basically start selling. Um, I mean, we could have brought that to market and be happy with it, but then we take that, um, you know, and then run it through uh, Matt's uh, pressure filtering process uh, that we partnered with him on. And that's how it becomes this really clean and smooth product by taking some of those uh, those chemicals that, that create bite, burn and aftertaste. So um, so that's kind of where it started. But yeah, it's it's all Indiana corn. I mean, it supports Indiana farmers, you know, so we really wanted to, I mean, it, when you look at the spirits world, um, if somebody has whiskey in their house, they probably have three to four or five, they might have 20, some people have 200 types of whiskey, you know, you're probably going to have uh, 10, 15, 20 is probably average. Um, I'll ask that same person that has 20 whiskeys in their house, how many vodkas do you have? They'll tell me one, maybe two. You know, so uh, I have I have, you know, Grey Goose uh, when it's just, you know, me and my wife drinking it. But when I have a party, I bring out a handle of, you know, Tito's or something else. And so it's a very brand loyal uh, product. But there, there's a good and a bad in that. The, the, the bad is it's extremely hard to get somebody to switch from your product to theirs. The good is once they do switch, they're probably going to move through more product than you would if you could get them to try your whiskey brand. And, and we knew that going in. And so we had to give our sales team and anybody trying the product as many reasons as possible. It's like, all right, um, if you don't care about that, it's a better product. If you don't like the packaging, the price is not low enough for you to change, even though it's a better price. Throw all those things out the window. But, oh, you you care that it's a local based, Indiana based, Indianapolis based uh, product that's supporting Indiana farms and and Indiana businesses, all right, well, maybe that's the thing. So we, we wanted to give as many people as many reasons as possible to try the product and convert over to this product, um, even if it means lower margins for us, even if it means doing things a little bit harder uh, to get to that end result, that it was worth it because you've, you've got to stack up as many reasons as possible to get somebody to actually change what they're doing. And I, I, I love what you're saying, that there's so many layers to the, the strategic marketing thinking there. Uh, and, you know, I think the people that are in their 40s and 50s that are drinking Grey Goose, for example, mm -hmm. I would propose, this is just a subjective opinion, that they started drinking it in their early and mid 20s. And it was, it was award winning. It had a beautiful bottle, but you didn't really, and it was, I think, French, right? I don't know. I don't know anything else about it. And yeah. And when you start thinking about today's market and the, the fact that people are looking for cleaner beverages and food. This makes so much sense. And you didn't stop there. You didn't stop there. That would have made a lot of people, man, I have just brought this amazing vodka product to the market, uh, barkeep.com, everyone. But you went, you went another step forward. Yeah. So the, the next iteration, I think where Rare Saint, um, where that brand came from and, and, and that you see that at, at raresaint.com and see the packaging and the bottle and the spirit. Um, the whiskey world is is fun and it's interesting, and it really came from a lot of our executives and a lot of our managers who, you know, like we're we're typically more of the the purists. I, I personally, my favorite cocktail and favorite drink is is an Elmo Cola, but Craig, our CEO, like he's he's a bourbon guy. You know, Carrie, uh, one of our bar managers at St. Elmo, he's a bourbon guy. So a lot of us enjoy just a pure spirit, you know, neat spirit. So it was like, Hey, if, if we're going to create this, this product, let's make something that we all enjoy drinking and we all want to drink. And in the whiskey game, there's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of it's built on scarcity and a lot of it is built on, you know, this mash bill and, and this whiskey that's been aged here and you can't get it because, you know, it's, it's allocated. And a lot of times the production is, uh, is done on purpose to to scarcity drives demand. And, you know, if you tell somebody they can't have something, a lot of times they want it more. And that's that game is never more prevalent than in the whiskey world. So um, we wanted to create a brand. We're like, let's just put the best possible whiskey we can put in a bottle. Um, our team is tasting through, you know, pretty much every barrel before it goes in a rare Saint bottle. So we know we have really, really good juice and and we don't do the actual distillation ourselves and and we're transparent about that where 
we're really good at in, in terms of whiskey is we've been doing barrel selections with, I mean, almost any whiskey brand in Kentucky. Um, most of the top whiskey brands out there, we've been doing barrel selections with them for 15 or more years. So uh, when you have a team that's tested and, and tried through a hundred different you know, barrel selections. I think we're on barrel number 24, 25 with Woodford Reserve. So um, we're really, really, really good at tasting and selecting whiskeys and knowing what whiskeys people are going to like. So instead of going, we're going to make this brand that's a whiskey brand, we're going to make, you know, 50 cases and and use that as leverage to get people to try our other products. We're just going, we're going to make the best damn whiskey possible that we can put in a bottle um, make sure that it's good and make sure that we love it and we know our customers love it and then we'll take it to market um, and it'll be as successful as as, as fast as we want to grow because we want to make sure that the people that want the whiskey can buy it and it's not this weird i gotta drive to you know Terre Haute to buy this one bottle of this allocated thing that just dropped on the shelf and a buddy's holding it for me and it's 120 dollars and like now, we're just going to put the best possible whiskey in a brand, build an amazing packaging, uh, amazing bottle uh, to support it. And, and you know, it's essentially the packaging is almost we took the route of, of almost creating a, a decanter, uh, which, you know, where do you put fine whiskey? Right. Um, my, my parents are, are British. Uh, my mother's from York and father's uh, Welsh. And so, you know, I've got decanters from, you know, from Europe that they've had forever, you know. And so it was kind of like that that idea to to put this whiskey in its own decanter uh, to let people know that we've really taken the time to create the best possible product to put in this pot in, in this bottle and and share it with the with our friends and anybody that wants to purchase it. Yeah, the bottle is beautiful. I mean, um, it, it, it definitely looks like a high end custom bottle that you guys have there. Yeah, yeah, it was a process. I mean, we started both of these spirit projects. Uh, we started uh, during essentially a little bit before COVID and, and, and really during COVID. And, you know, when you ask somebody a supply chain question about creating custom glass at that time, they said, uh, usually six to eight months, you know, eight months on the long end. It took us over two years. Um, you know, we ended up partnering with a, a group called Pirasol, who's based in uh, I think, I believe Italy, but, but based in Europe, I'm pretty sure Italy, uh, but Pirasol on, on the actual production and mold and all of that stuff. And so uh, and they're, they're one of the best in the world at it. So, uh, but just the process of creating that and shipping it was unbelievably difficult uh, and, and took five times longer than even they anticipated because of the challenges the world was facing with, with COVID and everything else. So um proud of it because of what it represents and and how good the packaging is, but probably even more proud of it because it was such a damn hard thing to do. <laughs> and, and we're glad it's uh we're glad we're we're finally finished with it and we've actually taken it to market. So um I got I gotta ask you, Bryn, you are such a busy guy. Um you know, entrepreneur, entrepreneur, you you've worked with um Joey Chestnut. I mean you you've you've created his influencer status in terms of numbers on TikTok. What what does a what does a guy like you do to keep it together? What do you do for fun? How do you how do you stay healthy? Um, gosh, great question. I think um, I, I always have the analogy that whatever you're doing, you can only row your boat in one direction. So, um, so in the mornings, I I try to get a workout uh, every morning. We were talking kind of as you said in the pre-show uh, about you know going on hikes and walking with people. I do that frequently with. Uh, people that I know and, and other people that are uh, that are challenging, um, you know, are doing challenging things and doing hard things. Uh, a buddy of mine is scaling up a tech company. Uh, Joey's the best eater in the world. You know, I try to spend time around people that kind of inspire me and 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 fuel me uh, and and just give me somewhat of a, a north star or something to to emulate and you know, and kind of feed off their positive energy. And then I'm, I'm always trying to do the same thing for them. And so um, the quick answer to your question is I, I don't have many friends. <laughs> I don't spend, I don't spend a lot of time. Uh, I suck at, you know, small networking things, but uh, I have a few really close friends that I know, um, you know, would, would drop anything for me and I do the same for them. And, and, you know, that's kind of how I live my life. I, I, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time with a lot of people, but um, I spend time with people that uh, 
uh, kind of challenge me to be a better person. And, and that's always been my focus. Um, and it's, it's served me well. That's amazing. Uh, surround yourself with people that inspire you or challenge you to do better. Uh, get a workout in the morning. Uh, mm -hmm. What about your sleep regimen? I suck at sleeping. I'll be completely honest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, I listen to uh, 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 Andrew Huberman podcast and, and kind of have, have taken some of his uh, sleep regimen and I, I've definitely gotten better at it than I was two to three years ago, but it's a challenge for me. I mean, uh, last night I slept good the night before I got out of bed at 2 a.m. because I couldn't turn my mind off. So um, it depends on the day. And and uh, yeah, that that's I, I think in terms of things I'm trying to get better at and improve for my own health and wellness, that's that's probably chief from, among it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, that that's a constant battle. I suck at it. You got any tips? I'm all ears. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll be happy to share my uh, imperfect knowledge. Uh, what about, um, what about cooking? I was so keen to ask you this, you know, you're surrounded by some of the most amazing food all the time. You know, what does, what does Bryn cook? Um, gosh, I love, I mean, it, so, uh, so my girlfriend, I'm actually at her place right now in Wisconsin. So, um, I travel a fair bit. Um, but I also, based on that relationship, you know, she comes to see me, I come to see her, but I have a lot of meals where I, I cook for myself and when I'm doing that, uh, it's very simple. I cook something clean and, and healthy, you know, um, eggs with vegetables, um, roast chicken, things like that. But, um, that's just because it, it's a way that I can not be, uh, 350 pounds, uh, because I could eat steak and, and drink bourbon every night if I wanted to. Right. Um, so I, I eat pretty clean and, and healthy when it's just me, but I really love cooking for a group. Um, you know, I have St. Elmo's King Crab mac and cheese recipe, you know, like I can look smart because I've stolen ideas from people who are a hell of a lot smarter than me. Um, and, and you pick up cooking tips, uh, just being around the amazingly talented chefs, uh, that we're around. So I think most people in our company have kind of become, you know, I don't know that I like the term foodies, but we really just enjoy food and love sharing it with other people and, and trying and creating new and innovative things and, and different things and just enjoying the experience, both from a cooking standpoint, as well as enjoying it with friends. So that's by far the most fun thing I'll do is cooking for a group of people. If, if I'm in a barbecue or a group, I'm, I'm the introvert that's in the kitchen um, or working the grill. Uh, that's where I'm comfortable. I, I'm more comfortable cooking for 20 people than doing small talk. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm going. Yeah. You're you're a you're a giver, you're a giver at heart. And uh that that's amazing. And you're an idea guy. Um yeah. so I want to make sure that everyone remembers uh you can find uh um the vodka at barkeep.com and yeah, barkeep vodka. Barkeepvodka.com yeah. and then rare saint rare saints. Yep, yeah, rare saint.com. Rare saint.com and the yeah, single yeah, just it just You'll search it and it, uh, it'll it pop up. And if it doesn't uh, hunt me down because our CEO, our, our, our SEO sucks and we'll have to work on that. But you, you <laughs> should find it if you search Rare Saint Whiskey. Um, I'm sure you'll find it. I mean, this has been amazing. What a great conversation. Um, any, uh, my last uh, question for you is any words uh, for people that are getting started in marketing or getting started with a you know, food or beverage brand? Uh, yes. Um, become a contractor installing plumbing or electrical. Um, any of those careers <laughs> would probably be uh, <laughs> more fun and less stressful. Um, no, it, it, I guess the food and beverage, the, the, the best advice I think I've learned, and, and I, I even forget it at times what the most important thing is, but um, you can spend money on advertising and building your brand and doing all these things and flashy videos and that, but there's nothing that can replicate making sure you have a great product. You start there. Uh, step number two, once you know you have a great product and that's been proven out, however you do that, um, you've got to get people to try the product. That is, that's the hardest thing to do in, in any CPG world. I mean, especially now when everybody's on click list and people buy their groceries based on what they bought in the past. So getting into somebody's consideration set of what they purchase is so damn difficult. Um, so getting people to try your product. If you're if you're a startup founder, 
and you go, I have, I have a, I have twenty five thousand dollars for marketing over the next six months, and that's what I have. I would encourage that person to literally sample. I would spend almost every dime of that into sampling the product and getting people to try your product for the first time. And in the process of them trying your product, tell them why you exist. And so great product, get people to try it, give them the story of, of, of why it matters and why they exist. And if you can do those three things, they're, they're the hardest things to do, but I also believe they're, they're damn near the only thing that matters. You know, you can't, it's hard to go in and, you know, be Dano's seasoning and go, all right, we're going to spend $2 million a month on influencer marketing. Most people don't have that budget. Um, and even if you do, it's not a proven guaranteed success. So there, there's a ton of risk in doing it that way. But if you make one-on-one -on -one connections with people that learn your brand story and love your product, that's where you that's where you win. And it, that's your best chance of success is, is following kind of those three steps. Win people's minds and hearts. I love it. Uh, product, uh, trial, and story. So there you have it, everybody. Um, Bryn, I am just so uh, honored and happy that we were able to do this. Um, I forgot to mention that you know my friend uh, Christina Nicholson, and you were on her podcast. What a yep. small! <laughs> yep. Yeah, I I love these things. I I, I guess as, as an introvert with ADD, um, the ADD is usually the person that says yes to everything, and I always, you know, want to connect with other people. But um, as an introvert, I, I love these conversations. Uh, if you put me in a cocktail reception, uh, the social anxiety takes over and I, I want to go hide in a corner. I, I just generally miserable at those types of things because it's it's just painful for me. And I wish it wasn't, but it is. But I love these conversations. So uh, if anybody else is listening that has a podcast, hit me up. I'll, I'll, I'll I'd love to do yours, too. So I, I enjoy these conversations. It's this will be the best conversation I have all week. So <laughs> thank you, Brandon. A huge thanks to you for joining us. And giving us a deep dive into all the different things you're doing and giving us a scoop on um, potentially what is the world's best vodka and rare saint. Um, I don't know about all the rest of you as you're listening, but I'm, I'm definitely feeling the need to uh, get uh, a cocktail immediately. Uh, so if you want to learn more about Barkeep, uh, bar, barkeepvodka.com, rarestaint.com. Uh, and uh, this has definitely been a conversation about the game-changing approach to taking products to market. That's all for today, everyone. Thank you again to Brim. Bryn, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, share this episode with your fellow cocktail enthusiasts. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, I'm Duncan. Stay curious, stay creative, and, and keep making the, habit, the magic happen. Uh, coming to you from uh, the Firebelly Social Show. Thanks again, Bryn. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is fun. Thanks for listening to the Firebelly Social Show. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.